been reserved for the king's pleasure. Therefore the king's portion is reserved for you. A prepared position awaits you with the king of kings sitting at the head of the table. He desires that you sup with him in the presence of your enemies. By accepting his personal invitation, your needs are met, the desires of your heart fulfilled, and to top it off you will receive the exceeding abundant above all you can ask for or even think of. Imagine that. The more you understand the king's heart, without a shadow of a doubt, you will begin to make more room for heaven's treasures. Welcome to King's Portion. This is Catherine Joy Foster. And the theme of our program today is a tsunami blessing inside and out. And this is part 168. God destined you to be adopted into his family. In fact, you are chosen from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ redeemed you with his own blood, reconciling you to God. You are an offspring of Jesus, a member of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. In purchasing you back, you could have been a slave or just another servant, but that never entered into the mind of Christ. You are a son of God. Now that's non-gender specific. But don't stop there because God surnamed you as his heir. But don't stop there either since God put his own name on you as a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Highly favored as a joint heir, you have the rights of the firstborn as well as the double portion. And then the Holy Spirit even helps you to feel comfortable calling God Abba Father, that is Daddy, Daddy. Now this first section we are going to address reconciliation, the son born from heaven. In Mark, the first chapter, the first verse from the King James Version says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. Jesus is the Son from heaven. And then in Luke, the first chapter, the 35th through the 38th verses from the King James Version shows how Gabriel answered Mary's question about how she would be impregnated with the Son of God. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power, that is the dunamis power, of the highest, Abba Father, shall overflow you, overshadow you. Therefore, also that holy thing, which shall be born of thee, Jesus Christ, shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is a sixth month with her who was called barren. And he goes on to say, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. I'm going to say that again. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And this word is the rhema word, the port forth word. She was agreeing with God said, which gave God space to move. And the angel departed from her and took her response back to put in the archives of God. Now let's also look in Luke, the second chapter, the 39th through the 52nd verses from the King James Version. And when they, speaking of Joseph and Mary had performed all these things according to the law of the Lord. They returned into Galilee 
to their own city, Nazareth. And the child, Jesus, grew. That means he became greater and waxed strong in spirit. That means he was increasing more in vigor, even in his spirit man, filled with wisdom, showing that he had insight and skill. And the grace of God was upon him, the graciousness of God. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of, of the Passover. And when Jesus was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they have fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing Jesus to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found Jesus in the temple, sitting in the midst of of the doctors hearing them and asking them questions and all that heard jesus were astonished at his understanding and questions and when they saw him they were amazed and his mother said unto him son why have thou thus dealt with us Behold, thy father and I have sought thee, sorrowing. And Jesus said to them, How is it that ye sought me? Was ye not that I must be about my father's business? Jesus recognized he was also the son of God. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them, and Jesus went down with them and came to Jerusalem and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom, showing that he advanced in wisdom and statute. That means that he had divine wisdom and human wisdom. And the statue means he was in a full maturity and in favor with God and man. Let's also look in John, the first chapter, the 29th through the 34th verses from the King James Version. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming into him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, speaking of Jesus, and I knew him not, even though John and Jesus were cousins in the flesh. He didn't know him in the spirit until now. It is but he who sent me to baptize with water, which is Abba Father, the same said to me, upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him, the staying on him, abiding on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now let's also look in Luke, the third chapter, the 21st through the 23rd verses from the King James Version. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, and it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily 
shape like a dove upon Jesus, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. God approved Jesus publicly. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as it were supposed, the son of Joseph, which was a son of Hela. Let's also look in John, the third chapter, the 30th through the 36th verses from the King James Version. And this is what John the Baptist says. He says, he must increase, speaking of Jesus, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard that he testifieth and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony has set to a seal that God is true. That means that there is evidence that God is worthy of credit because it is impossible for him to lie. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, speaking of the rainbow words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. That means Jesus was overflowing with the spirit of God because he hosted the rhema words of God. The father loveth the son and hath given him all things into his hand. He that believeth on the son has everlasting life and he that believeth not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Let's also look in Matthew, the third chapter, the 11th verse from the King James Version. And this is what John also said. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, Jesus, is greater than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. What is a message we'd like to have recurring throughout this time with you? Visit the sons of God throughout the scriptures. Adam, the first man, was created as a living soul from the earth. Jesus Christ became a life-giving spirit from heaven. And you, when you are born again, you too are recognized as a son of God. Your name is already registered as a heaven-born recreation in the earth. In that place alone is where you receive ultimate security, the sense of belonging, sufficiency, significance, and satisfaction from God himself. I'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Plan to stay tuned for the entire program today. The Catherine Joy Foster Music Ministries is a 21st century multimedia marketplace ministry. In your discovery, you will find the power of God present to go where you are to take you where Jesus is, raising you up, repairing you, restoring you, so that you can be as Jesus is in this world. Now available for workshops, banquets, conferences, webinars, concerts, prayer meetings. You can call area code 216-486-8615, extension 1. Again, that's area code 216 216- 486-8615, extension 1. Proud to be an advertiser for King's Portion Web Radio. 
Welcome back to King's Porsche. And again, the theme of our program today is the tsunami blessing inside and out. Visit the sons of God throughout the scriptures. Adam, the first man, was created as a living soul from the earth. Jesus Christ became a life-giving spirit from the heaven. And yes, you being born again, you are recognized as a son of God. Your name is already registered as a heaven-born recreation in the earth. Now, it's in that place alone where you receive ultimate security, the sense of belonging, sufficiency, significance, and satisfaction from God himself. Now, this second section, we are going to continue to discuss reconciliation, the son born from heaven, which is Jesus Christ. Now, this is Jesus' testimony that I'm going to read from the Amplified Version, the Classic Edition, two verses. The first one is from John, the fifth chapter, the 30th verse, and he says, I am able to do nothing for myself independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders, even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bitten to decide. As a voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right, just righteous, because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. Jesus, being born of heaven as the Son of God, when he entered into the earth, he was and stayed sanctified to God. Now, the second scripture we want to share with you is from John, the 14th chapter, the 30th and 31st verses. And he says, I will not talk with you much more, for the prince of the world is coming, and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. And there is nothing in me that belongs to him, and he has no power over me. And Jesus continues, but Satan is coming, and I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know, be convinced that I love the Father and that I do only what the Father has instructed me to do. I act in full agreement with his orders. Rise, let us go away from here. So now again, Jesus is showing that he is not only sanctified to God, but he's separated from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those things that are in the world system, which means he lived in the earth off limits from Satan. Therefore, Jesus is a, a perfect example of how to live. And he's not just pointing any way. He is a showing you the way because he is the way of salvation. Let's also look in Philippians, the second chapter, the fifth through the eighth verses from the King James Version, because it says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. That is the mind of Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That means he is the mastering son but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, which means he became the ministering son. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, but he conquered hell and death, and he has the keys. Now let's look at how Jesus dealt with 
temptation. In the fourth chapter, the first through the 14th verses, we are going to share with you how Jesus resisted Satan. And it's in Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost, that means he was completely occupied by Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan, this was after he was baptized, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it should be made bread. Satan tried to tempt him with the lust of the flesh, but this is what Jesus used to resist Satan. He said, as he answered Satan, it is written, speaking of the Logos word, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's showing that he had the life of God in him. And the devil taking Jesus up into a high mountain, shoot him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto Jesus, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for it is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. So how did the devil get the power and the glory of the world. He tempted Adam and Adam lost what God had already given him. And Satan goes on to say, if thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Now this second temptation was uh, the lust of the eyes. And Jesus answered unto Satan, said, get thee behind me. He's resisting Satan again. And he says, for it is written, the Logos word, thou shall worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. And Satan brought Jesus to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence for it is written he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against the stone now this is the third temptation and satan is using the pride of life and jesus answering said to satan it is said now this is ramos and this is the poured forth word thou shall not tempt the lord thy god and when the devil had ended all the temptation he departed that means he deserted him he desist to resist him in any way and he departed from him for a season and that season is the Kairos time. He was looking for a better opportunity, but he went out on his way to instigate, to revolt against him. But it says in verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit, and this power is Dunamis power, into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. After this 40-day temptation in the wilderness that he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of God, Jesus received promotion after that and he returned in the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit and God promoted him for his fame went through all the region round about. Let's show what Acts, the 10th chapter, the 38th verse, 
from the King James Version says about Jesus' ministry. It says that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, this dunamis power, who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus stayed sanctified to God as well as connected with the Holy Spirit. So God was with him when he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. And oppression means anywhere that the devil exercised dominion against someone. And we have that same ministry because we inherited the ministry of Jesus. Now in our program today, you can enjoy the music of Malachi Christopher and Chosen as they present, Come On In. What they're showing is that there is a place in the body of Christ for every inhabitant in the earth to occupy and to own. And he's speaking of in his song that there is a, a day that comes where we may die and go to heaven. And that is a definitely greater and a better and the most perfect place to be. But don't die prematurely. When Jesus died for us, he was 33 years old, but that was the end of his ministry so that on earth, so that you can live the rest of your earthly life with him living in your heart as a habitation of God through Holy Spirit where Jesus Christ lives in your heart. So let's hear, come on in, Malachi, Christopher, and Chosen, and I'll be right back. Come on in, come on in, rest a little while, rest a little while. 
visit us on the web at blog.kingsportionlive.com. That's blog.kingsportionlive.com. Thanks for staying tuned to King's Portion. Again, the theme of our program today is a tsunami blessing inside and out. Visit the sons of God throughout the scriptures. Adam, the first man, was created as a living soul from the earth. Jesus Christ became a life-giving spirit from a heaven. And yes, when you are born again, you too are recognized as a son of God. Your name is already registered as a heaven-born recreation in the earth. And in that place alone is where you receive ultimate security, a sense of belonging, sufficiency, significance, and satisfaction from God himself. Now this third section we are going to address, recalculation, the son born from earth. And this is speaking of Adam. In Luke, the third chapter, the 38th verse from the King James Version, and this is showing the lineage of Jesus, but when it gets to verse 38, it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So you see that Adam was the son of God. In Genesis, the first chapter, the 26th through the 31st verses from the Amplified Bible, the classic edition says, God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So again, the Son is Jesus Christ. Make mankind in our image and after our likeness and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame beast, and over all of the earth and over everything that creeps upon the earth. And that includes Satan, who has disguised himself in the serpent. So God created man in his own image in the image and likeness of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it using all its vast resources in the service of God and man and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, See, I have made you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the land and every tree with seed in its fruit. And he shall have them for food. So now he's showing that every plant and every tree had seeds, making it easier for them. This is what you call favor instead of labor. And to the animals on the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the ground, to everything in which there is the breath of life, the life of God, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was a very good, suitable, pleasant. And he approved it completely. And there was evening and there was morning, a sixth day. Let's also look in Genesis, the second chapter, the seventh through the 25th verses from the King James Version. And it says, And God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the life of God. And man became a living soul. So this is Adam born from the earth. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. 
and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So that's showing that it was not to tempt man with the lust of the eyes or the lust of the flesh. And he said, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So they were there in the midst of the garden. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. It was more like irrigation because there was no rain at that time. And from hence, it was parted and became into four heads. You see, God was thinking about expansion from the Garden of Eden. And the name of the first is Python. That is it which compasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good because God made it. And there is Bedellium and the Onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gahan. The same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hedekal, which is that which goes toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Still, this is favor, not labor. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. And that includes the tree of life. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should live alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So you see that God was not micromanaging him. He gave him the authority and he allowed him to use his authority. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. It's showing just how Adam had already had the mind of God, already had the life in him to be able to name all those animals and fowl and beasts. It says, but for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him, someone who would be a suitable helper, like a joint heir. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So this is the first operation that is performed by God. And I believe that there were no stitches and no pain afterward. And it says, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto him. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That means that they were intimately acquainted in such a way that there was no division and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? Because 
of the glory of the Lord was covering them. They had all of God and they surrendered themselves to him. So they had all of him and his glory. I'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. I was just standing there basking in the sun and all of a sudden I was soaking wet. There wasn't a sign in the sky, so I was unprepared without an umbrella. But in the end, it just didn't matter. I loved every minute of it. I knew I was living under open heavens. It really does give new meaning to being overtaken by blessing, not a dry spot. This is Fran the Fan of H-D-O-R. Uh-oh, here comes the rain again. been listening to King's Portion Live with web host Catherine Joy Foster. Welcome back to King's Portion. Again, the theme of our program today is a tsunami blessing inside and out. Visit the sons of God throughout the scriptures. Adam, the first man, was created as a living soul from the earth. On the other hand, Jesus Christ became a life-giving spirit from heaven. And yes, you are when you're born again, you too are recognized as a son of God. Your name is already registered as a heaven born recreation in the earth. And in that place alone is where you will receive ultimate security, the sense of belonging, sufficiency, significance, and satisfaction from God himself. Now, this fourth section, we're going to continue to discuss recalculation, the sun born from earth. And this we are speaking of is Adam. And in Genesis, the third chapter, the King James Version says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yes, as God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He's filling her out to see what she was going to answer. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. And that is including the tree of life. But of the tree that in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And now she has added something that God didn't say, neither shall you touch it. So now she's thinking that even if I touch it, it must be diseased and I'll die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. And this die is prematurely die. For God doth know that in the day ye shall eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods. They were already as gods. God had given them authority. He's given them dominion. And he said to them, Knowing good and evil. God wanted to teach them by mentorship, not by mistakes. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that is lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, that's lust of the eyes, and that the tree to be desired to make one wise, that is the pride of life. But they were already wise. And she's thinking, oh, I'll be prudent. That'll cause me to prosper. She believed the lie that Satan told her. She took up the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her a husband with her. He was beside her. This is Adam. He was right there. And he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed 
fig trees together and made themselves aprons. If the only thing that you receive from yielding to temptation is knowing that you're naked, something is really wrong. But what happened is they lost the glory of God after they sinned. And they heard the voice of the Lord God coming to the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. They were trying to camouflage themselves so they too could look like a tree or a plant. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? So this was actually the first court of heaven that God had in the earth. And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. He dreaded living. He said, because I was naked, he was exposed because the glory was gone. And I hid myself. He drew back from God rather than running to him. And God said to him, who told thee that thou was naked? And have thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And Adam said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So now this is Adam playing the blame game. He's blaming God for giving Eve to him and he's blaming Eve. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So now this is Eve being deceived by Satan, and now she is playing the blame game too. You see that God, even though he knew he's a omniscient, knowing all things all the time, he asked them. See, that's the mercy of God, that he didn't point the finger, he asked them. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because I have done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shall thy go and dust shall thou eat all the days of thy life. You see, God never asked Satan. He was already judged from when he got thrown out of heaven. And then this is what God said to him. And I will put enmity, hatred, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, speaking of Jesus taking the headship from Satan, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. Now this sorrow is pain, labor, hardship, toil, and thy conception. And in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, he shall rule over thee. They were supposed to be joint heirs of the grace of God together as a married couple. And unto Adam he said, Because I have hearkened to the voice of thy wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. So you see that that's how sorrow entered into the earth because there was no sorrow in the Garden of Eden. And he says, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. So they went from eating green plants in the Garden of Eden to eating herb of the the field. And then God goes on to say, In the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread, 
And that means you're moving from favor to labor because that's what the curse does. Till thou return to the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And to Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. So this is the first blood shed in the garden because the skins were animal skins. And so he was actually still covering them in the earth. And the Lord God said, behold, the man is become as one of us, speaking of Abba Father, speaking of Jesus, speaking of Holy Spirit, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. What was wrong with that? It was that Adam and Eve would have lived in the fallen state, in their sin, never being able to have the blessing of the Lord upon them forever. So God was protecting the tree of life, which they could have eaten instead of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, the Lord God sent them forth from the garden of Eden to till the land from whence he was taken. And so he drove out man. And again, that word drove in Hebrew means he divorced them. But you know what? When Jesus redeemed us, he bought us back with his own blood so that we can be his body in the earth, but also his promised bride. And God placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. That means to guard it so that they would still have hope in the earth. Now in our program today, you're going to enjoy the music of Marilyn Wright as she presents Give Me a Clean Heart. See, she recognizes in there that with that clean heart, it will be pure and perfect before the Lord. Just like Jesus was sanctified unto God and separated from the devil, it's because he had a clean heart. But what Jesus did on the cross that gives us communion with his body and communion with his blood gives us a clean heart when we partake in the new birth and become the recreation in the earth that God preordained. So let's hear, give me a clean heart, Marilyn Wright, and I'll be right back. Oh 
to King's Porsche. And again, the theme of our program today is a tsunami blessing inside and out. Visit the sons of God throughout the scriptures. Adam was the first man created as a living soul from the earth. Then Jesus Christ became a life-giving spirit from heaven. And yes, when you are born again, you are also recognized as a son of God. Your name is already registered as a heaven-born recreation in the earth. Now, in that place is where you can only receive ultimate security, a sense of belonging, sufficiency, significance, and satisfaction from God himself. Now, this fifth section, we are going to address regeneration, the sons born as offspring from the sun from heaven. Let's first look in John, the 20th chapter, the 22nd verse from the Passion Translation. It says, then taking a deep breath, Jesus blew on them, speaking of his disciples, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And the footnote for that verse says, the Greek word used here does not appear elsewhere in the New Testament. However, it is the same word found in the Septuagint, for when God breathed, into Adam's nostrils, the breath of life, the beginning of new creation life came from the breath of Jesus. The mighty wind of Acts 2 was the power, the dunamis power, the breath Jesus breathed into his disciples in this verse that was life. So now you can see the disciples were the first ones to receive the new birth. Let's also look in Matthew 19, 28 and Titus, the third chapter, the fifth verse, because these two talk about regeneration. So what is regeneration? From the Greek, it said it's the new birth, the renewal from pain it gives you a genesis. This is a spiritual renovation. Now, when you look at the word regeneration from the 1828 dictionary, it says reproduction, the art of producing a new. And then new means over again, another time in a new form to create a new. That's recreated in Christ Jesus. So let's read those verse from Matthew the 19th chapter, the 28th verse from the King James Version, and Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Let's also look in Titus, the third chapter, the first through the seventh verse, again from the King James Version, it says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Now, these are human governments. This is not the demonic spoken of in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. To obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And this is those who are not opposed to God's law, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lust and pleasures, that's lust of the flesh, of the eyes, and pride of life, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, God's mercy 
is showing that he has compassion and it is compassion that is passionate and he saved us by the washing of regeneration now that washing there is a bath or baptism in the renewal and renewing of the holy ghost which he shed on us abundantly through jesus christ our savior so this mercy is that he shed on us and when you're thinking about compassion that he wants to help us more than even we may want to be helped but the help is there so we're not talking about having the change of a heart with this renovation which was shed on us abundantly through jesus christ our savior that being justified by grace and this justified is being made innocent not just not guilty but innocent by his grace his graciousness we should be heirs according to the hope of eternal life let's also look in second corinthians the fifth chapter and the 17th verse from the king james version says therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature all things have passed away behold all things are become new so passed away means that they are dead so don't resurrect them and then let's look in john the third chapter the first through the 21st verse from the king james version and there was a man of the pharisees named nicodemus a ruler of the jews the same came to jesus by night and said to him rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from god and no man can do these miracles that thou doest except god be with him jesus answered and said unto him verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto Jesus, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter and to the kingdom of god so this is with pure water of the rhema word that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of spirit is spirit marvel not that i said unto thee ye must be born again the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou heareth the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth so is every one that is born of the spirit nicodemus answered and said to him how can these things be jesus answered and said unto him art thou a master of israel and knoweth not these things verily verily i say unto thee we speak that what we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness but i told you earthly things and you believe not how shall you believe if i tell of you heavenly things and no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven even the son of man which is in heaven now jesus always spoke of himself 99 percent of the time as a son of man and he's showing he was the man that came down from heaven so he did not promote himself he allowed god to do that for him and as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and when he did that they were healed so must the son of man be lifted up that means that he would die for the sins of the world so that they could receive 
salvation, which includes healing. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This he's speaking of the son of God, for he is the son of God. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And I'll just put in here Jesus because this is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, that his deeds should be reproved. But he that doth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, which are wrought in God. Let's look at two more verses. In 1 John, the fifth chapter, the fourth and fifth verse from the King James Version says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So now faith is born of God because it is the faith of God that we use in the earth. It's a supernatural faith that comes from God himself that has the life of God in it. And it also says, who is he? that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. So that's showing here uh, that when you're born again, you overcometh the world because salvation comes because you believe that Jesus is the son of God. Then let's also look in 1 John, the third chapter of the second verse from the King James Version. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, this is the time to begin to see Jesus as he is. The Bible lays out all the different characteristics of the truth that you can trust. But you may not know Jesus as your personal savior right now. And you can receive this invitation that Jesus can become the Lord and savior of your life even right now. Why don't you say this prayer after me? So, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. And I recognize Jesus is the only way and his blood that was shed for me. Give me that opportunity to come into the family of God. So I ask you to forgive me of my sin, iniquity, transgression that was against you, others, or even my own self. And I ask you to come into my heart, Jesus. Be the Lord and Savior of my life and now i know that old things have passed away and behold all things are new and now i am the newest creation in the body of christ and i thank you for my salvation in jesus name i pray amen now if you said that prayer why don't you email us at info at kingsportionlive.com that's info at kingsportionlive.com and we'll send you some encouragement along the way now let's return to remaining portions of king's portion live after this message from our sponsor we invite you to visit our new interactive website please log on to www.kingsportionlive.org that's www 
kingsportionlive.org. We believe that you will discover something that will speak to the royal blood in you. Thanks for staying tuned for the conclusion of our program today, which bears the theme, the tsunami blessing inside and out. Visit the sons of God throughout the scriptures. Adam, the first man, was created as a living soul from the earth. Jesus Christ became a life-giving spirit from heaven. And yes, when you're born again, you too are recognized as a son of God. Your name is already registered as a heaven-born recreation in the earth at the time of your new birth. And that is the only way that you can actually receive ultimate security, a sense of belonging, sufficiency, significance, and satisfaction from God. Now this last section, the sixth section, we will continue to discuss regeneration, the sons born as offspring of the son from heaven. That is Jesus birthing the church. In Romans, the eighth chapter, the 14th through the 17th verse from the King James Version says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Adoption what? As a son. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So you have to remember this, that we are a spirit with a soul in a body. And when we are saved, it is the Holy Spirit coming on our spirit, coexisting to make the change from the old man to the new man. Let's look in Galatians, the fourth chapter, the first through the seventh verse from the King James Version. It says, Now I say that he heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, Jesus Christ, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, Holy Spirit, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. He's helping us to feel comfortable calling God daddy daddy wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son and if a son then an heir of God through Christ let's look in Isaiah the 61st chapter the seventh verse from the amplified bible and it says instead of your former shame you shall receive a double portion and instead of humiliation your people shall shout for joy over their portion therefore in their land they shall possess double what they had forfeited everlasting joy will be theirs what is showing here is because we are joint heirs with jesus he's sharing his space, he's sharing God's grace with us. He's no longer the only begotten of the Son. He's the firstborn among many brethren, but because he's sharing with us the joint heirship of the inheritance, we have rights of the firstborn as well as the double portion that the firstborn receives. 
Wow. Let's look at the next three scriptures because it'll show that God has sealed us. And this sealing means in Greek, protection and preservation. In John, the sixth chapter, the 27th verse from the King James verses, labor not for the meat which perish, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him have God the Father sealed. So now this is Jesus being sealed by God, but calling himself the Son of Man. In 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, the 21st and the 22nd verse from the King James Version says, Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. And so God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So now Jesus is not anymore on the outside when you're saved, but he's on the inside through Holy Spirit in our hearts. Let's also look in Ephesians, the first chapter, the 11 through the 14th verse of the King James Version. And it says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, inheritance of a joint heir with Jesus Christ, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, that after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So now we see that Holy Spirit is the down payment that we received so that we can get the rest of the inheritance after we receive him. Let's look in Romans, the eighth chapter, the 26th through the 28th verses from the King James Version. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. So here is Holy Spirit cooperating with us to deal with any frailty we may experience for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered so this is actually through the baptism of the holy spirit that holy spirit intercedes for us and then it says and he searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession and that is intervention the first one mention of intercession was actually interceding but this was intervening for the saints according to the will of god and this according is joined to the good acceptable perfect will of god and we know that all things work together for good to them that love god to them who are the called according to his purpose. Let's also look in Romans, the eighth chapter, the 33rd through the 39th verse from King James Version. It says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now that word elect in Greek is favorite. He's considering you as his favorite. It is God that justifieth. That word justifieth in Greek means to render innocent. So you're never guilty. You're never not even not guilty. You are innocent as if you never did it in the first place when the blood of Jesus covers you. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ who died. Yea, rather, that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So this intercession is intervention. So he's not just uh, 
praying for you. He's moving in to make sure that he is the way for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So it looks like uh, that you are subject to death instead of life. So let's look what that says is nay. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. How could that happen? Because Jesus gave himself for us and he is the conqueror. And the more than a conqueror means that we resist, but he's already won the battle and he's given us the spoils of war. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He sees you as inseparable to him. So when we're facing temptation, let's look what happens in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, the 12th and the 13th verses from the King James Version. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. So you're not being picked out to be picked on. But God is faithful. He is breach proof. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation also make the way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Understand this, that the temptation and the way of escape are there together because it's showing this is how you choose life. This is how you choose premature death. But he says every time that there is a temptation, there's also the way of escape. But let's go further than that. So you know what you're looking at and what you're looking for, that you choose life every time. In Exodus, the 20th chapter, the 20th verse from the Amplified Version of Classic Edition gives you 2020 vision. It says, and Moses said to the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you so that the reverential fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. So now he's saying that this reverential fear before him is the way of escape that will be there when the temptation is there. And not only that, we now have Jesus who is our advocate before the Father to help us. He is our strong consolation. Why? Because uh, he too was tempted in all points, yet without sin, the perfect sacrifice for us. So when we read Jude the 24th and 25th verse from the King James Version, we know that this is Jesus who is keeping us from falling. It says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of a, his glory with exceeding joy. That's a triumphant, glorious state that doesn't change. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Let's give you several other scriptures to help you along the way. It is 1 John, the second chapter, the 15th through the 17th verses from the King James Version. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doth 
the will of God abideth forever. So when you look at the temptation that Jesus went through, as well as Adam, those are the areas that the enemy would try to entice you with. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus showed us how to do it, to live sanctified to God and separated from the world. Every choice that he ever had to make, he allowed our Father to make it for him. Let's listen to this last verse, 1 John, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse from the King James Version. Herein is our love made perfect, that we will have boldness in the day of judgment. And the day of judgment in this case is not the eternal judgment, but every time that you will receive a harvest. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Because as Jesus is, so we are in this world. And what is that? World overcomers. How would we like to leave this program with you today? As an heir of the world, own it and occupy it. Let the testimony from Acts, the 17th chapter, the 6th verse inspire you the ones who turn the world upside down have come here too that is really right side up in the kingdom of god that is a revolution that is what happens when you live through jesus christ and live surrendered to the spirit of god and the word of god that's regeneration you are in the world but not of the world Begin to see Jesus as he really is. That is how you will be as Jesus is in this world. As your seeing transforms into being, you will renounce the old life that is of the world system. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the life of God. Abundant life, resurrection life, and eternal life. This is Catherine Joy Foster for King's Portion, where we speak to the royal blood in you. You have been listening to the King's Portion with radio host Catherine Joy Foster. Today's podcast is available for download. Log on to blog.kingsportionlive.com or email info at kingsportionlive.com.